This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're revisiting my conversation with poet Jerrica Brown, who has written about police brutality in his poems. This episode was originally recorded on May 8th, two weeks before the death of George Floyd. These days, anxiety and fear linger longer than we'd like. How are you searching for relief? Writing can be cathartic. My guest began writing after he discovered poetry as a child during visits to the library with his mother and sister. Now, Jericho Brown is a creative writing professor at Emory University in Atlanta, and this year he was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry for his collection called The Tradition. Brown joins where we live to talk about his poems, how he challenges the rules of poetry, and his advice for new poets. Have you read The Tradition? It's Brown's third collection of poetry. The Pulitzer Board called it, quote, a collection of masterful lyrics that combine delicacy with historical urgency in their loving evocation of bodies vulnerable to hostility and violence. Jericho Brown is joining us via Zoom today. Jericho, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Lucy. I really appreciate that. I have to say, I've been reading so much of your work and hearing and listening to you read your poems, watching multiple interviews. I wish we could be in the same room talking, Jericho, but this will have to do. (laughs) Isn't it something? Um, Aren't you really glad that uh, if we did have to endure something like this, at least we had to endure it after the age of the Internet? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Exactly. So I guess I'll start off with, when you heard that you won the Pulitzer Prize, what was your reaction? I cried. Um, <laughs> I was sitting, it's really funny. I, um, I had uh, gotten up to use the restroom in the middle of the night and uh, there had been a text message that came through from my editor, Michael Wiegers, and it said, it said something like pulling for you or rooting for you. And I had actually forgotten the, the announcement was going to get made that day. I thought it might have been Tuesday or Wednesday, but it was Monday. And I couldn't get back to sleep. And the, the announcement was made at three. So from, from that time I used the restroom at 3 a.m. to the time that I, um, that I heard my name, I had been awake. So I felt like a, a little bit of exhaustion had been lifted quite, quite, quite literally. You mentioned exhaustion having been lifted. But what did it mean to you? I had mentioned to our listeners at the top that you discovered poetry as a child. You began reading it, writing it. And to hear that you have won the Pulitzer Prize, when you think about all of the the poems you have written over these last several years. Well, it's the 70th anniversary of Gwendolyn Brooks having won the prize. And Gwendolyn Brooks was the first black woman to win the prize for poetry. And so I felt like I was indeed walking in the footsteps of someone whose poems had meant the world to me when I was a kid and continued to mean the world to me in my adulthood. Uh, I also felt uh, like I had been given a gift, um, that my my stage had been made a little bit wider. Uh, and therefore, I would have a responsibility that I would have to take on. I first learned about the prize when I was in elementary school, when Rita Dove won the prize. And so I understood that it was a big deal because there were life-size, um, life-size photos <laughs> of Rita Dove in my elementary school, Cattle Heights and Cattle Parish in Louisiana. And I remember thinking, who is this black lady? (laughs) And understanding that there was a possibility for me uh, that that I didn't understand before. And over the years, you know, uh, then I was a kid, maybe I was eight or nine or 10 years old. And over the years, more and more, I begin to realize that possibility as my life work. In an interview, uh, you said that you hope this Pulitzer will bring you a little more freedom. What do you mean? Well, I just mean that you never know what's sitting. Sometimes you don't know. There, there are things you're aware of that are sort of sitting on your shoulder. You're, there are things you're aware of that are barriers to you. And you try to remove those barriers as an artist because in order to make art, you have to be completely free. You have to have everything at your access so that you are able to write whatever you need to write and so that you can tell the absolute truth, no matter how subversive or radical that truth may be or seem. Uh, so for me, when I, when I think about that kind of freedom, I think about a freedom that um, is not bounded by any institution 
or your parents or your kids or um, any um, any financial situation of freedom that uh, that would make me free to write um, whether or not I was going to get a check for the writing. So uh, the Pulitzer Prize, whether I was obsessing about it or not, it's because we know about it, we know that it's an option. We know that it is something that could very well possibly, though there's one in a 300 chance of it happening to you every year, it could happen to you. Uh, and so since it has happened to me, though I was not, or I don't think that I was thinking about it, at least now I know I won't be thinking about it <laughs> as, <laughs> as, something, um, as something to work toward. I would rather work toward beautiful art then work toward the recognition for beautiful art. Hmm. I was wondering if you could read one of your poems for us uh, from the tradition. Again, this was the collection that won uh, the Pulitzer Prize for poetry. Could you read Water Lilies? Yeah, I'll read that for you. And I should probably say this book is uh, very much a pastoral book. It's a book interested in the natural world, in our environment. Uh, and so um, many of the poems are indeed about flowers. And I understand that if I call a poem, The Water Lilies, we begin to think of Monet. The Water Lilies. They open in the day and close at night. They are good at appearances. They are white. I judge them, judge the study they make of themselves. Aspir aspirational beings, fake if you ask me. If you ask me, I'll say no, thank you. I don't need to watch what goes on only imagining itself seen. Don't need to see them yawn their thin mouths and feed on light, absolute and unmoved. They remind me of black people who see the movie about slaves and exit saying how they would have fought to whip Legree with his own whip and walked away from the plantation, their eyes raised to the sun without going blind. You're hearing poet Jerrica Brown here on Where We Live. Uh, that's one of the poems from the tradition that won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry. Tell us more about uh, that poem and how you talk about whiteness throughout the tradition. Yeah, it's really funny. Um, I've never, I haven't, I sort of messed up on my reading of that poem because I don't read it as often as I read other poems from the book. And part of the reason I don't is I'm realizing it's a very shady poem. <laughs> you know? um, look, I don't think I realized that I was, I was just as shady as this poem is. Um, so the poem starts talking about flowers. They open in the day and close at night. They are good at appearances. They are white. And at the moment that we say they are white, of course, and in particular, obviously, because you're talk, uh, there is a, a Black poet speaking, it seems that suddenly we thought we were talking about flowers and we seem to suddenly be talking about white people, which is, you know, that could happen. Um, I judge them, judge the study they make of themselves, aspirational beings, fake if you ask me. Uh, and this is all... Um, me personifying those flowers or, or the speaker imagining the flowers uh, doing more than flowers could actually do. This is something I, I learned um, from Sylvia Plath's uh, poem, Tulips, a poem I love a lot. Um, and I have my students read every semester. I'm a professor at Emory University. And uh, one of the things that I love about that, one of the enjoyments I think of reading that poem is that you see the speaker lose her mind based on a single image. And so in this moment, I think I'm losing my mind based on looking at these, these flowers. Um, if you ask me, I'll say, no, thank you. I don't need to watch what goes on, what goes only imagining itself seen. Don't need to see them yawn their thin mouths and feed on light, absolute and unmoved. And I think that move right there is the move that pushes us at, at, just before the turn in the poem, just before the Volta, the move, uh, it's a sonnet, just before the Volta, the, the move that pushes us into thinking about um, whiteness, as you say, Lucy, uh, this moment where I say, um, I don't need to watch what goes, only imagining itself seen. Um, and I think that that is indeed part of what I do 
in the book. I want, um, one of the things that I want the poems to, to make clear is that uh, everybody has a race and there's no uh, default race. <laughs> um, and that we're all experiencing what we experience experience given our background, given our region, given our race, given our um, economic situation. Uh, and therefore, if we can begin to see that within ourselves and understand the history of ourselves, of our families, of um, how we came to be in this nation, if we begin to understand the history of that, I think we could then have a little more empathy for, for one another, for those of us whose arrival in this nation is very different um, from, from our own arrival in this nation. Um, but what's, in, what's really interesting to me about, um, about this poem is not just the way it deals with whiteness through the flowers, but how it deals with a certain kind of, of blackness, a certain kind of, um, of uh, uh, what I would call respectability politics or, or a blackness that doesn't really fully understand its own history. Um, in, the, in, the, in the sestet I say, they remind me of black people who see the movie about slaves and exit saying how they would have fought to whip Legree with his own whip and walked mm -hmm. away from the plantation, their eyes raised to the sun without going blind. So ultimately, I am saying this way of looking at white people is actually no better than this idea um, of, of a blackness that does not honor our ancestors um, as fully as it should, that, that does not have an understanding of just how many slave rebellions they were. I mean, I think when I was writing this poem, I was a little mad at Kanye West <laughs> and mad at, at Quentin Tarantino, you know, um, that, mm. that movie that um, I can't remember the name of, um, Django Unchained with Jamie Foxx. Um, this idea that somehow slavery is the fault of, of black people who did not rebel, though there were always slave rebellions going on in the history, in the history of slavery. So things that happen, uh, I think, because people are not aware of history, this idea, you know, Legree is actually a character from Uncle Tom's, Uncle Tom's ca cabin, um, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, this idea that, that, uh, bl that if you had been a slave, you would have somehow fared differently from all these other people who had to endure such atrocity. When we talk about the tradition again, uh, there are uh, so many uh, poems that we could focus on, but I wanted you to talk more about some of the themes that you're bringing up as well. When we hear uh, how this collection questions why and how we've become accustomed to terror, uh, tell us a little bit more about how you went about writing uh, this collection. What was going on in the world at the time that you, with, with yourself, uh, that you took uh, to, to paper uh, to your computer typing these poems? There were a few things, actually. I think the, the, the chief thing among them is that I had the opportunity to have experiences with art that I had not had before. I mean, in some cases, simply because I hadn't had the opportunity. For instance, I went to the Biennale in Italy and I saw more art at once than I had ever seen before. Um, and some of the most beautiful art I'd ever seen before. Uh, but, but even more than that, um, there was art that hadn't existed before that I was able to see. Um, Moonlight uh, by Barry Jenkins mm -hmm. um, and, and Claudia Rankin's Citizen. You know, the truth about being an artist, the truth about being a writer is that you want to put yourself in a position where all of the art is as available to you as anything else that you're walking by all day. One of the things that I tell my students is that they want to listen to poetry just as much as they're listening to any other kind of music. Uh, I put every song I own on shuffle. And so um, right after uh, Future and, and Trap Music, I might get some gospel music with Yolanda Adams. And then right after that, I can hear uh, Nikki Giovanni reading Ego Tripping. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I want to make um, art plain and I want it to be a part of my everyday life. Uh, the other thing that happened is that I became, um, as, as we all did, um, it became very clear to me that... Um, that I was going to have to stop watching certain things on social media because I was getting overwhelmed and terrified by them. Uh, in spite of the fact that it was a life that I had understood that I was living, you know, I know what it's like to be thrown across a car by the police off by police officers for absolutely no reason whatsoever. That has happened to me. I know what it's like to be followed by police officers in my own, in my own driveway that I own. 
um, mm -hmm. to be asked questions for absolutely no no apparent reason. Um, and while I while I know what that was like, I was not at what I, while I know what that's like. I was not prepared for all of the video footage that we were seeing of um, of people being uh, brutalized by police officers, unarmed people, unarmed black people and brown people being murdered by police officers. The list of people uh, committing suicide supposedly in police custody. Um, but then there being um, really weird circumstances under which they supposedly committed suicide. A lot of that was coming to me. And I think that's one of the reasons uh, the book began. I was working on my, um, I was working on my flower bed uh, in front of my house, right in front of the porch. And one of my new, new neighbors in this neighborhood, I love my neighborhood, they came up to say hello to me. Uh, she walked right by me in the driveway and rang the doorbell. Mm. And I looked up and um, she looked down at me where I was working in the yard. And she said, um, oh, I was just looking for the, the man or woman of the house. And I said, um, well, it's me. <laughs> and um, she was immediately and very clearly embarrassed. And I realized in that moment that she could not imagine me. She couldn't imagine me working on someone's flowers, but she couldn't imagine that they were mine. Mm. She couldn't imagine that my investment in beauty had reached myself. And, and that, that seemed to me um, <clears throat> very odd considering the fact that I grew up around black men who really cared about what their yards look like and who planted flowers every year. Your father. So I think you? that, yeah, my dad, my dad um, actually made a living um, making people's landscaping very beautiful. And, um, and my mother, uh, my mother who was a school teacher at one point later in her life made a living um, cleaning people's houses and making them very beautiful, making them smell good. Um, so, so I was uh, I was always growing up around the kind of labor that led to beauty, and that labor went into our own home. Um, but it wasn't until later that I realized that other people would not identify me with some as someone invested in that same in that same beauty. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of how um, those themes begin uh, began. Uh, I am as concerned about the ways in which we are destroying our planet mm -hmm. as anyone else would be and should be concerned. But I'm also concerned that we understand that um, environmental issues do indeed intersect with issues of race, issues mm -hmm. of gender, in issues of sexuality. Um, so that that's part of what, that's some of what was happening. Um, the other thing I have to be honest and say that was happening was the Me Too movement. Uh, mm -hmm. And I felt like, in some ways it was very easy of me to talk about race and racism and blackness and whiteness, but that it would be, um, I would have to take a different kind of a risk to talk about the fact of my own sexual assault mm -hmm. and the world outside seemed to be calling out to me to be honest about that fact. Mm -hmm. Was that hard for you to be so personal in these poems? Uh, I'm wondering how your family reacted uh, to when they uh, found out about your sexuality or even as you write and talk about uh, being HIV positive. Well, it's an interesting question. You know, I don't take my parents to work with me <laughs> <laughs> and, and nobody else is expected to, you know, Lisa, Lucy, when Lucy, when, when, um, you know, your your family might listen to this show or they might not. Mm -hmm. Do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, if you were a checkout person at Kroger's, no one would expect you to bring your mom with you to, to watch you check people out. Um, if you were an architect, nobody expects you to show the plans for the new mall to your dad, right? Um, so one of the things that I realized early on in order for me to make my poems was that I was going to have to make them on my own um, and that the support that I got from my family would be the support that I was definitely doing this on my own, not that they would be involved in reading the books or that they would even get books. Um, if they want access to those things, they're always welcome to them. Mm -hmm. But I don't bring trouble back home. Mm -hmm. When I'm writing poems, I know I'm going to make trouble <laughs> because that's what <laughs> poems should do. And when I say that's what poems should do, I'm not just talking about Jericho Brown. I believe that when we look at the real life history, the real life history of poetry, not just in the United States, but in the world, is that it is always subversive. 
It is always radical at the moment that it is being written. It is always asking us to move toward a, a field of invention. And when we're living in invention, we are in a position where we make it very dangerous for dictators. We make it very dangerous for uh, oppressive regimes. So um, I, I have 100, 127% uh, full support of my family because I don't get in their business and they don't get in mine. <laughs> um, well, uh, Jerrica, was, but to answer your question, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. I'm listening. Oh, go ahead, Just, you, to wanna, answer, you wanna finish it. To, to answer your question about how hard, how hard it is, um, it's very hard. Um, it's not difficult, I mean, it gets less hard the more you do it, uh, but the whole point is that it's hard because it's your work, it's your life work, it's what you're invested in. Um, everybody we admire lives a hard life. We'd like to believe that they live an easy life because um, we're under the impression that capitalism, that a bunch of money somehow makes everything easy. But no matter how much money LeBron James or um, Serena Williams has, I actually do not want to put my body through what they put their bodies through. Do you understand what mm. I mean, Lucy? Mm. Um, so we're, it's very, it's very difficult, but when I'm writing, I don't think about people seeing the poems. I think mm. about dealing with the demons mm. of my past in an honest way. And I have to do that for me. So can I ask you when you're reading one of these poems in front of an audience and you're seeing them react, how do you respond? Um, well, I don't really, I don't really, I guess I don't really respond other than when I'm reading poems in front of people, I'm really just thinking about reading the poem correctly. I mean, my mind is on the fact that I don't want to mess up <laughs> much more than it is mm -hmm. the audience's reaction. Um, my job during a reading is clarity and I want to be clear. Um, I understand, you know, I've gotten hate mail. Um, I've said things in poems that lead people to um, to write awful social media posts about me. Do, do you know what I mean? Mm. But I also know that that's what I signed up for. Um, if I if I don't have some resistance from somebody, that means I'm not doing anything. Mm. Um, so it's actually when people are concerned or worried or when people have fear about my poems, um, it's better confirmation for me that I'm doing what I'm supposed mm -hmm. to do. Uh, I'm mostly, to be quite honest with you, after I give a reading, um, I'm mostly concerned with how uh, there's, no, there's no reading for which you can know what's going to happen after the reading as it relates to how many people are going to buy the book at the book table. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really thinking about um, doing my job and I see being on mm -hmm. tour or giving a reading as a part of, as a part of the job. Mm -hmm. My guest today is Jericho Brown. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning poet. His latest collection called The Tradition. We're going to talk more about that after the break. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My guest today is poet Jericho Brown. The Emory University creative writing professor is the winner of this year's Pulitzer Prize for Poetry for his collection called The Tradition. Uh, Jericho, I, I asked you about what it was like to win the Pulitzer, but we're all here in quarantine. What's it like for you not only winning the Pulitzer, but also the fact that you know you can't go on a tour and you can't have conversations with people in person uh, or do your poetry reading? How have you been responding? Well, one of the things that I, I decided um, even before I won the prize, uh, I didn't know I was going to win, uh, but I, you know, I, I, I was thinking as it, as I was, you know, I, like I said, I was three in the morning and I was up mm -hmm. till three in the afternoon. I was thinking, well, if I do win, what am I going to do? Because I can't go party. <laughs> And I do like to party, Lucy. Um, <laughs> so I, I was thinking what I should do is I should do the thing 
Because if I had won the Pulitzer Prize, I would have enjoyed um, every dance, every nightclub, every um, drag show that would have been available <laughs> to me that night, you know? I mean, I really would have twerked. So, <laughs> so um, I was thinking if I win, you know, and I was thinking if I had won the Pulitzer Prize, it is definite that the Atlanta Police Department would have very soon found out that I had won the Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> um, and so I was, I was thinking to myself, I was thinking to myself, so if that is my response, if I could go out, if I would be so utmost about that, what is the utmost response since I can't go out? And I realized if I win the Pulitzer Prize, my, my response is going to be more introspection, more meditation and more gratitude. And that's exactly what I did when I, um, when I found out I came into my living room and I spent the rest of the entire day sort of gazing out of the window into my, into my yard and into um, the, these, uh, these three beautiful uh, crepe myrtles I have in front of my house that I love so much. And I, um, and I really just thought about where, from where I had come, to be quite honest with you, mm -hmm. and how lovely it was to receive such an honor uh, so I spent a lot of time uh, sitting there, honestly, in tears. I lost, um, I should say, we lost our pastor when I was a kid. Uh, my pastor was a man, a wonderful civil rights leader named Harry Blake, um, who was the pastor of the Mount Canaan Missionary Baptist Church. And we had lost him to, um, to complications related to COVID mm, uh, just, a, just a few weeks before then. And so I was thinking about, about him. And I was thinking about my grandmother and I was thinking about all the people who I wish could have seen me in this moment when I had won the Pulitzer Prize. And I was I was sending gratitude to their memory, to be honest with you. And, and that's how I celebrated the day. Um, and that's how I plan to continue to do it. Uh, there's a you know, I have to believe there's a reason why I am where I am every moment that I am there. And so um, at the moment where I am now. I'm gonna take this as introspection. I love being around people and talking about poetry. I probably love it more than anything else. Um, well, maybe, I mean, I love cuddling more than anything else. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, you can't even cuddle right now. If you don't have somebody, you out of luck. So, <laughs> so, I, um, so that's the kind of thing um, that I'm thinking that maybe uh, is, is, is why I'm here. I know that, um, I'll say it this way, next year's Pulitzer Prize winner hopefully won't have to um, be a winner under these same circumstances, mm -hmm. which means I'm unique in this way. Mm -hmm. and, and which also means that I'm being called upon um, for a different set of responsibilities. And I just hope I meet those responsibilities mm -hmm. uh, as the year goes on. Can I ask you to read another poem? I was wondering if you could read Stand. I can read Stand. Um, I'm glad you asked me to read it because it's a poem I love to read. And I usually read it, if not at the end, um, maybe toward the end of, of readings. Uh, mm -hmm. I should say, oh, I mentioned cuddling. You know, this is actually a poem about cuddling, <laughs> which is my, my favorite. I love poetry, but, you know, nothing beats, nothing beats cuddling. <laughs> Stand. Peace on this planet or guns glowing hot. We lay there together as if we were getting something done. It felt like planting a garden or planning a meal for a people who still need feeding. All that touching or barely touching, not saying much, not adding anything, the cushion of it, the skin and occasional sigh, all seemed like work worth mastering. I'm sure somebody died while we made love. Somebody killed somebody black. I thought then of holding you as a political act. I may as well have held myself. We didn't stand for one thought, didn't do a damn thing. And though you left me, I'm glad we didn't. Hmm. 
I wanted to ask you to go back to something you said earlier when we were talking about um, how you started writing about the tradition and the things happening in the world around us, including uh, the the murder of black men uh, by police officers, unarmed black men. We're talking today when another black man um, has been murdered, murdered in February, Ahmaud Arbery. How are you thinking about violence and terror and what do you want people to think about when they're reading these poems? Um, I, I want people to think about love. You know, I mm-hmm. do think that that's very clearly a poem um, about this moment. Mm-hmm. Uh, the poem that I just read, it is a poem about us becoming much more aware of what black people understood was going on, um, that us widening, right? That the us goes from black people knowing that this happening to, is happening to everyone knowing that this is happening. And I think the next step after the knowledge is love and the next step, um, you know, where there is love, there is justice. Uh, I, I am not interested in us watching these things over and over again and being satisfied with uh, the repeat the rerun. It's like watching, you know, a 70s TV show. Um, you know, we see the violence go down. Everybody watches the video of the violence go down. And then a few a few weeks later, we hear no indictment. Mm. Um, and that's really hurtful. And it's particularly hurtful when you know that the people sitting in prison, um, the people sitting on death row for crimes that they may or may not have committed are black and brown people. Um, so uh, what I think about this poem is that uh, while it is a poem, that says it felt like planting a garden or planting a meal for a people who, who still need feeding. And while it does say um, it seemed like work worth mastering, I'm sure, no, I'm sure somebody died while we made love, somebody killed somebody black. I thought then of holding you as a political act. Um, it also does, uh, as it says that, it also says all that touching or barely touching, not saying much, not adding anything, the cushion of it, the skin and occasional sigh all seemed like work worth mastering. And I think the antidote for all of these ills is love. Um, I really do believe that and I wanna make it clear to people because I think when, when I talk about my work because my work is indeed involved in these things as it should be, Uh, What people forget is in every one of these poems, in every poem I've ever written, um, there is a reaching out for something that is beyond uh, the terror and the evil. And that reaching out is absolute and 100 percent love, radical love for one another. If we have radical love for one another, then we are interested uh, in one another's well-being uh, and we become much more understanding of the kind of fears people are walking around with, and we want to calm those fears. Mm. There's a lot of fear uh, right now um, with this virus uh, in our communities, also hitting communities of color particularly hard. Talk about the writing process for you right now, and how would you tell people to seek relief in writing? How should they begin? Well, one one way to... um, One way to seek relief in writing is to understand that uh, if you're new to it, that means you're not going to be so great at it. And that's okay. (laughs) Um, One of the things that I I always tell my students is anything you do well, you didn't do it well the first time you tried to do it. Uh, I always uh, I ask my kids, you know, who can cook and my students, I should say, who can cook and they'll raise their hands. And I'll say, no, who can really cook? Who can cook? Like, if I eat it, you're going to get a ring. <laughs> and, you know, there's usually just one hand left. And I say, what do you? What can you cook? And that person will say something like lasagna. And I'll say, oh, you got a good lasagna on you. And they're like, yeah, I got a good lasagna on me. And I say, um, what happened the first time you made lasagna? And every time, <laughs> that first lasagna was nasty. Do you understand what I mean? So that first poem that you try to write is going to be nasty. (laughs) Um, But you have to keep at it uh, and you have to begin seeing failure as an opportunity. I mean, what I really love 
about this moment is in my conversations with people, I'm finding that people are trying to do certain kinds of things they never tried to do before. I have a, a very close friend, um, Michael Riley, who lives in, in Florida, who's learning to do a handstand, which is a, a step-by-step daily process. <laughs> um, and I think if we think about step-by-step daily processes, then we can, we can begin to come to writing, uh, thinking not about um, achieving something like a Pulitzer Prize, but instead thinking about play, thinking, oh, all I have to do is get it down and it'll, it could be a good time. Uh, what I love about things like rhyme is that rhyme allows us the opportunity to play with sounds in a way that is simply enjoyable. I mean, everyone remembers being a kid and first rem- learning that words rhymed, learning, oh, time, lime, Fine, you know, and I would do that when I was a young person. And I would like to see more people try to tap into that, uh, Mm. the joy of words, simply because they sound good coming together. Mm. There's so many great poems in the tradition. I wanted you to talk about this new poetry form, the duplex. Yeah, Um, I invented a form called the duplex, which is um, at once a huzzle, a sonnet, and a blues poem. Uh, The Huzzle being um, one of our oldest forms ever. I think it's something like maybe a sixth century Persian form. Mm -hmm. Um, It's definitely a Persian form, but I think it's sixth century. I could be mixing the century up, but it's a very old form that asks asks for juxtaposition. The other thing that um, it has a repetition at the end of every couplet, it's a form in couplets. And uh, what I really love about The Huzzle is that it requires you to say your name in that mm-hmm. final couplet. Isn't that amazing that there's a form that says you have to say who you are. <laughs> you have to claim this poem. It asks that you sign the poem in the last couplet. Um, so you have to find reason to say your name. And we're, you know, m- most of us are much more familiar with the sonnet, 14 lines of rhyme, diambic pentameter. The blues poem um, is the poem um, first developed by people like Langston Hughes, but before that in music, song by people like Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey, um, uh, you know, a bar of the blues sounds like, um, rock me baby, rock me all night long, rock me baby, rock me all mm-hmm. night long. I want you to rock me till my back ain't got no bone. Uh, so I was thinking about these forms and I was thinking about how I'm a person who is so often called to the mat about my own identity. And I do not feel like I am 66% black and 12% Southern and 3% mm. queer. And I don't have any, I don't sit around measuring myself in measuring cups, you know? Um, and I don't feel like I'm at war with myself. You know, the word is that Southern folk don't like black folk and black folk don't like queer folk. And it's impossible. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, I feel like I am 100% all of those things and 100% Naomi's son and 100% my sister's brother. Do you understand what Mm. I mean? And I think we're all walking around with several identities and those identities aren't and don't have to be at war with one another. Um, and, And so I wanted to make a form that allowed me to better see myself whole as I begin to see myself whole in my own poems. Um, And so the the poem is at once a huzzle, a sonnet, and a blues poem, nine to 11 syllables a line, which I think um, approximates iambic pentameter and and reaches out, you know, in time and space to the east and to to forms that require syllabics. So, um, yeah, that's the duplex. And that's that's why I wrote it. Could you read one of them? I'm thinking of the one on page 72 of the tradition. Oh, yeah. So uh, I should probably say before I read this particular duplex, Lucy, that this duplex is a is it adds a layer of form onto all <laughs> onto all of those forms. <laughs> Forgive the poetry nerdness going out into the world right now. No, we uh, love it. This one is also, this uh, this one is also a cento, which means mm-hmm. it takes all of its lines from other poems. This cento is a little bit different because I take all of the lines from all of the other duplexes in the book to make this particular poem. Duplex, Cento. My last love drove a burgundy car, color of a rash, a symptom of sickness. We were the symptoms, the road, our sickness. None of our fights ended where they began. None of the beaten 
end where they begin. Any man in love can cause a messy corpse, but I didn't want to leave a messy corpse obliterated in some lilied field, stench obliterating lilies of the field, the murderer young and unreasonable. He was so young, so unreasonable, steadfast and awful, tall as my father, steadfast and awful, my tall father was my first love. He drove a burgundy car. You're hearing Jerrica Brown on Where We Live. He's a poet, 2020 Pulitzer Prize winner for poetry. Uh, that, uh, that poem from his book, The Tradition. We're going to continue talking with Jericho right after this short break. I'm Lucy Nalpithanchel. This is Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, but uh, with us on Zoom today is Jericho Brown, the 2020 Pulitzer Prize winner for poetry uh, for his book, The Tradition. He's also the director of the Creative Writing Program and a professor at Emory University in Atlanta. We were talking about this new f poetry form that you created, Jericho Duplex. I'm wondering uh, how your students helped inspire you with this new form. Uh, well, I actually, when I was um, writing it, I was I was not thinking. I actually wasn't teaching that semester when I finally got the poems done, and maybe that's why I finally got the poems done. <laughs> um, um, so the first duplexes were written with a, a a little a different kind of a freedom than what I experienced. Um, than what I always experienced because I had a some release time that I was making use of to finish this book that we're talking about. And um, but since I've written it, what I really love is experimenting with my students. Our um, last workshop, well, maybe it's, it was our penultimate workshop. We used the time to write duplexes, and they've been trying to write duplexes. And they would come to me like, "Dr. Brown, when are you going to show us how to write a duplex?" And I'm like, "Come on, get out of my face about a duplex, you know." <laughs> so they always, uh, I have the best. I have the best students in the whole world. Uh, and I can't believe how blessed I am to have the students that I've had. Um, and many of them are wonderful poets at this point in their own right. Uh, people like um, Eloisa as, as Miss Kua and, uh, and Wesley Rothman. And uh, so I've, I'm really proud of myself as a, as a teacher because I'm proud of my students. And my students always push me uh, in ways that I would other, otherwise not be pushed. I mean, I'm, I remain a big reader of poetry mostly because my students ask me to find things that I otherwise would not look for. I read their poems and I need to give them recommendations of things to read. And I say to myself, I don't know anything like this because my students are so special and unique and original. And then that sends me to the library. That sends me to the bookstore. That sends me to look at reviews. And when I'm looking at these things, I'm trying to find new books for my students to read. Um, and so they're the, really the people who keep me invested in contemporary poetry, because um, as I help them, they help me know what's out there. Uh, and as I talk to them about writing, about discipline, about sticking with a daily writing practice, I'm put in a position where I have to um, do that myself. I'm convicted by them and they make me a more disciplined person mm -hmm. because I can't ask of them what I'm not willing to give as a poet. So I, I, love, I love my students and you don't wanna ask me about them because I'll talk about <laughs> them for too long. Well, um, really, it. really, Lucy, it's really serious. I will start naming names of people you've never seen before. <laughs> I just Damn. worked on these um, theses with Kira Tucker and Sarah Cunningham, and they are two of the most amazing poets. I got an email the other day from Peter Witzig and from um, and from Nora Sullivan. I mean, Nora Sullivan is actually one of the greatest poets walking mm -hmm. around on the planet. And whenever her first book comes out, she's going to be on your show. I promise you. She's amazing. <laughs> Peter's amazing. Peter's going to like take over the country. He's like totally, mm -hmm. completely a poet who's a rebel and he's going to burn everything down and mm -hmm. start us all over again. So they're all like, they're just amazing students. Jericho, we just have a few minutes left and you mentioned contemporary uh, poetry. How do you, uh, you recommend that uh, writers make poetry more accessible? Because not everybody, uh, we, we learn about poetry when we're in school and some of us continue to be lovers of it. Others, we step away from it. How do you make it more accessible to people? 
Well, I, I think um, one of the ways to make it more accessible actually has to do with the, with us understanding writing as we understand every other art. You know, I, I meet people all the time who have the nerve to say, I hate poetry. And I'm like, no, you don't. That's a lie. Do you know what I mean? And if you ask those people, oh, you hate poetry, you don't have any poem you like, they will then recite for you the road not taken. Or <laughs> do you know what I mean? Or they will then recite for you We Real Cool by, by Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, so I think our relationship to poetry has to be similar to our relationship to music. You know, when we listen to music, we don't hear every song, though we picked the radio station, though we made the playlist. But every once in a while, a song comes on and wherever we're standing becomes our own personal dance floor. Like, oh, that's my song. You know what I mean? Um, so, Lucy, I really think that uh, it has to do with being able to have the experience with poetry that you have with art that you see. You know, you walk around your city or your campus or your world all the time and every, and there's art everywhere around us mm -hmm. Lucy mm -hmm. but only every once in a while are we do we see a painting or a sculpture that stops us in our tracks and we're like wow you know nobody says I hate art nobody says I hate music um, the expectations for poetry are higher what we want for poetry and this is why poets win <laughs> what we want from poetry is more than what we want from any other art uh, and I think what we have to do is we have to learn to put things down if we don't like them and say that's okay mm -hmm. and move on to something we do like. I'll tell you this quick story before we end. The way I found a book of poetry I love, a poet I love, I love the poems of A. Van Jordan. And the way that I found a book called Rise, his first book of poetry, is that I used to, when I was very young, go to the, the bookstore and I would go to the poetry section and I would read the first line or two or three of every book of poetry, the first poem, the first few lines. And if by the second or third line I was not interested, I would put that book back and I would go to the next book, which means the day I found A. Van Jordan's book, I had gone from A all the way to J. <laughs> and for whatever reason, I got through the first poem. If I get through a first poem, that means I'm going to read that book. I'm trusting that poet at that point. And all your job is, is to put away what you're not interested in and to continue to look for what you love. It's like, you know, house shopping. Nobody says, I don't like living in a house. But in order to find a house, you got to look at a bunch of houses. Mm. Uh, Jerrica Brown, uh, we just have a couple of minutes. Could you read one more poem for us? I'll read, um, I think you wanted me to read bullet points, right? So I'll read that. Uh, and so uh, maybe this will speak to some of what we're seeing today. Uh, and I thank you so much, Lucy, I should say, for having me here. Well, thank you. This is poet Jerrica Brown. Bullet points. I will not shoot myself in the head. And I will not shoot myself in the back. And I will not hang myself with a trash bag. And if I do, I promise you. I will not do it in a police car while handcuffed or in the jail cell of a town I only know the name of because I have to drive through it to get home. Yes, I may be at risk, but I promise you, I trust the maggots who live beneath the floorboards of my house to do what they must to any carcass, more than I trust an officer of the law of the land to shut my eyes like a man of God might, or to cover me with a sheet so clean my mother could have used it to tuck me in. When I kill me, I will do it the same way most Americans do. I promise you, cigarette smoke or a piece of meat on which I choke or so broke I freeze in one of these winters we keep calling worst. I promise if you hear of me dead anywhere near a cop, then that cop killed me. He took me from us and left my body, which is, no matter what we've been taught, greater than the settlement a city can pay a mother to stop crying, and more beautiful than the new bullet fished from the folds of my brain. 